went through a bit. You guys just did a, uh, a drill, if you will, um, and there were seven or eight different guys there. What were what were their roles in that drill? Well, a gun crew is made up of nine men total. The only man that actually has the title is the gunner. He's usually a corporal, and he oversees the other nine men while they're loading uh, and preparing to fire the field piece. The number one man would ram the charge down. Number two would clear the gun out and place the ammunition into the barrel. Number three, he would place his thumb over the vent and prevent air from being introduced because the powder, the powder bags were actually made out of a cotton flannel, similar to a woman's nightgown, and any air rushing in might fan any embers and set off the gunpowder and prematurely fire the cannon during the loading process. Number four actually pulls the lanyard, the cord that attaches to the primer, and fires the gun. Number five runs back and forth to the chest, bringing up ammunition. Now, he shared that role with the number seven man who, it, again, it's a 50-yard dash from the gun to the limber chest where they carry the munition. The men would get tired over that period of time, so it was that sh responsibility was shared between the two men. Number eight and number six cut fuses, kept count of the ammunition, and when the chests became depleted, would call for other vehicles, limbers, to bring munition up from the caisson and resupply this gun. So a piece like this could stay in action for quite some time. Usually there were six guns to a battery, accompanied by six limbers, and additional six caissons with another set of six limbers. So by the time you finished, you had over 20 vehicles, counting baggage wagons, um, traveling forges, and about 109 to 115 men and officers, almost uh, 150 horses as well. So an artillery battery like this was quite a sprawling uh, venture. Now, how many, uh, how long would it take for each, this whole process to go through to actually get one shot of the cannon, if you will? Well, dur during Civil War uh, standards, they utilized a standardized drill, and they were expected to fire once every three minutes. Now, the reason for that was Civil War ammunition was expensive at $2.64 a round. But um, they could fire as rapidly by skipping some of the safety procedures, such as sponging between rounds. They could get as many as three to five rounds off a minute. However, the danger to the crew increased as they did this. Start to clear. So you had six cannons. Were they filing simultaneously, or did they stagger? It would depend. If they were attempting to achieve a certain effect, they could fire in battery. They could fire by half battery, three guns and three guns, by section, in pairs, or they could take independent fire where they would just commence firing, and as rapidly as you could load, you would discharge your piece and then continue the evolution. In certain circumstances, such as uh, this battery, Battery for Rhode Island at Antietam, they fired over almost a thousand rounds in a single day. So the rate of fire can be quite, quite rapid if uh, circumstances call for it. As far as kind of safety protocol, was there much of a safety protocol back then, or were they just they were just firing as, as often as they could because they had people coming at them? Again, that would depend on circumstances. If you're shelling a, a village or fortifications, you wouldn't fire as rapidly. Again, gunpowder is volatile, and they're in black. Uh, they're in. In fact, I can even show you a sample. They're in cotton flannel powder bags. They're in cotton flannel powder bags. Now the bags are flammable. If any embers were left behind and you should hit one of those embers, the powder bag would burst and the man loading the gun would be struck by not only the flash, but by whatever was discharged from the gun. In the event of a charge where they were being rushed by men with bayonets, they would be skip all of these safety procedures and fire as rapidly as they could. 
Okay, this is examples of some of the ammunition that a artillery piece like this would fire. Everyone's pretty common. The average cannon uh, fired, for the most part, the smooth bores, the non-rifle guns, fired a solid shot. A solid shot usually decided the size of the cannon, so if it fired a six-pound shot, it was a six-pounder gun, 12-pound, and so on. The shot is attached to a wooden base called a shoe or a sabot. That would then be strapped to, by these tin straps, to the powder bag. And this was loaded in one complete unit. When it was fired, the ball would skip along the ground, as you probably saw in the movie The Patriot. Uh, that was a pretty accurate interpretation. Uh, and many times, uh, men would stick their foot out thinking they could stop this, and there was far too much kinetic energy left in it, and it would often sever the limb. Now, when they changed these guns over, a lot of them could fire additional munition, such as, in this case, this is a shell. Now, a shell is basically just a hollowed out cannonball with a fuse. It's attached in the same fashion as the solid shot. When the cannon is fired, the flame would envelop it. This is a flash concentrator. Light the fuse. Now, it's not like a fuse you would see in a firecracker. It's more like a little cigar that you would cut to a given length and press into the end of the, pea, of the shell. When it ignited, it would fly through the air for a given amount of time, and then it would burst the charge that was inside the shell. It would fracture, and the pieces would strike your enemy. As the enemy got closer, as I mentioned, when you started skipping safety procedures, this is what's called canister. It's basically a can filled with small steel balls, and this is an example. If you'll notice, it's cut away and it shows the steel balls inside. This would be loaded in the gun and fired as close as 300 yards to the very muzzle of the gun. It would eventually turn the cannon into a giant rolling shotgun. Um, in an emergency, you would take a powder bag, the canister, and take a second can and stack it on top and fire the whole mess out of the cannon. One tactic they often used was to skip it off the ground, picking up stones and dirt along with the shot that came out of the, the canister round itself. Later on, they would take a lot of these shells and they would increase their size to use in rifled cannon. Here's an example. It's more of the modern bullet-shaped projectile you see today. This, too, is an exploding shell, but now it has an impact detonator. So when it would strike the ground, it would detonate the shell and, and it would explode and fragment. Well, the cannon we're firing today was originally cast in 1845. Its original predates the Civil War. It was cast as a six-pound smoothbore cannon, but just before the Civil War, it underwent a process called the James Conversion, where they actually machine or broach into the gun rifling, just like you see in today's uh, modern weapons. Oddly, rifling went back to the uh, American Revolution. Then it was used to help clean guns, keep guns clean from repetitive firing. But they've learned that the, the accuracy of, of the ordnance fired out of them increased greatly. Um, so again, the gun is original. It's cast out of uh, bronze. Originally mentioned as a, it started out life as a six-pounder and turned into a 12-pound rifle. And um, as far as its particular history, um, we're unsure if it served in the Civil War. We know that it more than likely served in the Mexican War. Um, it's one of two that we own. Uh, the other one is a six, still its original smooth six-bore gun. Um, we also work with an organization called Maine, the Mounted Artillery of New England where we are one of the only, working with them, the only mounted the artillery edge, uh, units uh, in the, the New England area. Um, how many of these are actually around? Oddly, oddly enough, there are quite a few. Many are in private collections. I know there are over 300 cannons similar to this, um, not this exact model, at the Gettysburg Battlefield. The James rifle, the James conversion, there cannot be more than maybe two dozen. Uh, many of them were cut up and melted down after the Civil War for, for their bronze value. Um, used to cast a sec, um, additional Civil War cannon and its outdated Army ordinance. Once it no longer serves its purpose, it's just taking up space in an armory. As far as functionality, though. It's still a very effective weapon. Um, we have fired this gun live at National Guard target ranges. and. Um, it's a very effective target. In fact, we were firing at a few vehicles, and I don't think today's military would be thrilled with the effect that we could still have on those type of uh, ar lightly armored and tracked vehicles. How about the accuracy on them? Is there any accuracy? You just kind of during the during the Civil War, everything was line of sight. And when you, that's why many battles you see were fought in large open fields. If you couldn't see it, you didn't shoot at it. Unlike today, where we have directed fire, we fire at targets we can't see or they're miles away. 
and not so during the American Civil War. If you saw it, you shot at it. If you couldn't see it, you didn't spend the expense of ammunition. Uh, and, and maybe a little bit about uh, your the uniforms that you guys are wearing today as well. Well, the uniform I'm wearing is based on an original pattern. I'm wearing a mounted service. This is a volunteer's jacket. If you'll notice, a lot of the jackets have variations, um, both in color and in style. Um, state units were issued their own uniforms. I mean, during the first battle, Bull Run, some units, northern units, were wearing gray uniforms, and some southern units were wearing blue uniforms. They sorted that out right away due to the confusion it caused. Um, the uniform I'm wearing is a mounted services jacket with mounted trousers. The instep is reinforced to prevent uh, extra wear from riding on horseback. Uh, I'm wearing a sergeant sash, which eventually went by the wayside. It was just something else to get caught. Um, the average soldier weighed about 125 pounds and carried about 30 pounds of equipment on him. And uh, they weren't very much different than we are today. <laughs> Young men going off to war. Um, like I mentioned, Battery, Battery B is a local organization. We're out of Providence, Rhode Island. I've been reenacting over 30 years. I started, I was a teenager. My kids have done this. Um, I've got friends and family that have been involved in this for years. I've come to know a lot of nice people, and we are always looking for new members. Good.